Salt Moon um, from out from Southern Illinois University Press, winner of the Crab Orchard Series and Poetry First Book Award, and the Chapbook Canyon out from Red Dragonfly. Dragonfly, excuse me, Press. Crook's poems have have appeared in Best New Poets, New Letters, Shenandoah, and other journals. She is the poetry editor for Sun Editions and lives in Raleigh, North Carolina. Please welcome the welcome. Hey, um, so I had a dream the other night that that tonight came around and there was only one person in the audience, <laughs> and it was Newt Gingrich. So, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but um, I'm really glad to see all y'all out here. I don't see Newt anywhere, so this is good. Um, okay, so I figured since it's Mother's Day coming up, I'll read a few of my mom poems, um, and I apologize. I've got some diehard friends who are here who've heard these before. Um, so I'll start with <coughs> Dog Heart, which actually is not about mothers, it's about a dog, but I think mothers and dogs have a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm terrible at finding pages. Okay. Dog Heart. He lies still, breath clouding the slight ties between, tiles between his paws. Only the occasional twitch of an ear mars his perfect vigil. He has grown old following the girl, his only lamb, has watched her since a diaper wrestled at her thighs. Now she is gone all day, and he waits for her here by the door. He has contemplated the demise of the mailman, who moves too close when he hands her packages has dreamed the warm brine of the bus driver's blood. <laughs> Do not misjudge this old dog. Beneath dull fur and steepled bones of his ribs runs the keen rush of valve to ventricle, the old thrill of a bared tooth. <laughs> so this next poem, I've never actually read out loud, so pardon me if I stumble. This is actually like, this is a Mother's Day poem because I wrote it for my mom who's here tonight. And, um, and it requires a little bit of backstory. So I was born with kidney problems and um, was from the time I was born had to go through a lot of different procedures. And I can remember even at two knowing that that was harder for her than it was for me. Um, so this is a, about that. Um, and it's called Demeter in the Pediatric Ward. And I, most of you guys know that Demeter was the goddess of the earth and her, her, um, my goodness, uh, her um, daughter Persephone was uh, abducted by Hades and taken into the underworld. So. When they come before dawn, wielding thermometers and rattling their scales, she'd be standing by the door, hair wild, no lipstick, to tell them they'd better not be waking me up for nothing. Down cold fluorescent hallways, we come rolling after treatments, her tripping on the stretcher wheels, and she'd send the nurses packing, smooth my pillow, sometimes slip in bed with me, our little silver-sided bark. From the world outside, the sun slipped through Venetian blinds, and she measured sorrow in small cups of ginger ale we'd sip through frail bent straws. How could I not press my face into her belly, trace the blue raised veins in her hands? She turned to mist in the hall while I lay with the devil in the knife light of the treatment room. Um, so I'll read another hospital poem. I, I don't, these are not very nice Mother's Day poems. I <laughs> <laughs> but this one's about my own daughter who's fine. She's a teenager now, so she's scaring me in all different kinds of ways. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is called Storm. How quickly the heart hunkers down for the worst like the day the whole East Coast braces for a Category 4, and you're just digging candle stubs from the kitchen junk drawer when the school nurse calls 
to say your daughter's gone partially blind in math class, her right arm dead, and by the time you drive her to the pediatric ER, one stump numb hand pressed like a sick child to her breast, you have already practically rented a wheelchair. Seen her face pale against hospital sheets, whir of the respirator, wiped drool from her cheek, the words no and please wheeling like seabirds against shredded clouds of your brain. Old tuneless song of a lost sailor's mother, unscathed and unscathed and unscathed. And in the exam room, under noxious fluorescence, you number her bones, while the nurses enter and leave, and you think of lifeboats. The huge clock above her, blind as a moon, till the doctor arrives to tell you how the CAT scan was clear, MRI clean, unfath something unfathomable, potassium levels, her not eating lunch. Then you breathe what feels like the first clean breath of the blue-lipped rescued. Just breathe and breathe the entire way home. Don't even think of the storm still lolling over the Atlantic, leisurely dragging its malignant heart toward shore. The candles left strewn on the kitchen floor. How later you'll watch her sleep in their frail circle of light. Um, so here's a, a lighter one um, on, on learning to love teenagers and unconditionally. And I, I started this actually when I found pornography on our kitchen PC. <laughs> so, the secret lives of the animals. One chicken I have loved, bought with my own nickel at the feet and grain when I was nine, taken from my arms when he outgrew the wire cage beside his bed, stood tiptoe and opened the red flower of his throat to the sun. Three children I have raised to their season of breast bud and first shaves, and in the hothouse darkness of their rooms, their desires tendril into places I cannot nurture. Seven dogs I have loved, including the rescue with a taste for his own shit, but not least the childhood spaniel mix who made quick work of my best hamster. And now this small white terrier bred to please who shimmies with joy when she greets me mornings, whose best friend is the gray cat, half prince of sofa shadow, half Jeffrey Dahmer, that, if the cat were smaller and the timing right, might lick her heart. <laughs> and who am I to unlove the terrier for her descents into the cat's basement workshop, uncolored dark from which she returns, tail wagging, bearing a crinulated meat-tipped wing or garnet-throated chipmunk head. Once, at my oldest's age, I brought home to my own mother a necklace of hickeys, <laughs> crimson as suns, each mouth-shaped mark a talisman of want's slow burn, secreted in my mind the look of the boy with freckles and red hair his lip pulled back to ugly snarl when I undid the buttons on my dress. At night, the young dog shimmers like a moth across the grass. And though invisible in shadow, I know the cat flits in tandem, lets the dog flat back him in the mulch, purrs ecstatic when she mock mauls his upturned gullet, wild pantomime of hungers I can and cannot fathom while here sweetling I call her, here wildling, come to mama. Um, so I'll, I'll read a book, a point that's a little bit longer. I've, I've not read this one either. Um, in longer, by longer I mean I have to turn the page. I, I write short points. <laughs> um, so, so I realized when I was putting the manuscript together that a lot of these poems are about landscape and how landscape sort of shapes us. Um, and this is about a house my husband and I bought before we had kids. 
Um, and uh, it, it was an old ramshackle farmhouse and it ended up being a small plantation seat. So this is about sort of learning to live with that, um, that very dark history, um, which I know has shaped my children and all of us. House. Sway-backed, molting, mildew blackened between fallow tobacco fields. It sprung shatters, set shutters sagging like flagged wings. The house foundered under the oaks when we came, fresh from the city and just married. An exercise in history, we learned that slaves had built the place. At the courthouse, ferreted out Captain Archibald Capehart's deeds for 14 unnamed field hands who'd loaded oak beams numbered at the mill and hauled them by wagon down 20 miles of mud road, dug a cellar out of red clay. Now it sits squat, white as an egg, at the end of the dirt drive, smug in the coat of paint we gave it last spring, and in the time it's taken to find the right green for the master bedroom and bury three good dogs out back, we've learned the crooked landscapes of its unplumbed walls, their blunt odor of horsehair wadding on afternoons when damp slicks the corrugated roof and mold grows on our shoes in the mudroom, on winter mornings, the frail constellations of speckle dust sifted silent as strychnine from the cracked hall ceiling. The walls here are swollen with stories. Blank-faced, serene, they keep secrets of whole families held restless and musty in the plaster. The caught breaths of children playing hide and seek, slow crumbling of marriages, little treacheries of brothers, smell of another brought in and noticed on a husband's hands. In my daughter's room, the cry of the mother whose boy died in her arms, skull smashed when his roadster missed the curve. Our own stories sidled up next to those of Captain Capehart, laid out and bathed on the dining room table, all the mirrors hung with sheets, Hot nights, when sleep swings out of reach, the windows thrown open, I hear them confabulating behind the plaster. Dry, querulous whispers threaded with the twirling of the crickets, and half dream how someday the house will fall, victim of a faulty wire or deserted in some end of world disaster. The wind lifting its tin lid for rain, Thin lathes loosening, all our stories sliding into mud. How maybe it will stand for a while like this, a dark skeleton against the pines, marker only for those who move silent across pitched joists, matching and joining the beams, the ring of their hammers rising into blue immaculate sky. Noel, could you speak just a little louder? Oh, sure. We don't want this word. <laughs> <coughs> um, so I'll, I'll switch from the personal poems. Um, I started uh, this next one on um, a little island in the Caribbean called Bonaire, which was um, actually used in the well for a couple of centuries by the Portuguese and Spanish as a prison camp. Um, and they would basically just bring these, these prisoners in and work them to death in the salt flats. Um, and when I started doing research on it, I found that many of the prisoners uh, were women who had been accused of infidelity. Is that better, Aunt Liz? Maybe? Can y'all hear in the back? Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, about that. It was sort of a gulag and paradise, which seems strange. <laughs> Notes from a salt flat prisoner, Bonaire. On this island, love, there is nothing but black and white. The sea's a flat back that keeps us. Bleak shards of coral hone sharp as knives by tireless wavelets. And the salt, vast blinding pans for us to rake. 
It galls our wrists and shins like manacles. Nothing grows here but these crystals. Even the dark seaweed swirling in the inlets rises on spindly legs as if to swim away. Small black lizards whisper names of home against dry rocks and we boil them for it. We are sick of fish. All day the sun's blanched eye seeks us and not one rock big enough to hide under. I am changed by this place. Like Lot's wife, I look back, reconfigure the purple shadows in the struts of your ribs, your tongue in my mouth like pure fire. Here there is no holy water or sin. Each night we bathe ourselves in brine, lie under a black color of sky, the spume of white salt stars, the salt white moon, the sting of crystals blooming on our skin. Um, so this next one is about a friend of mine who was a concert pianist for years and um, was suffering with Parkinson's. The piano teacher. The disease has taken a blitzkrieg turn. Synapses at the bottom of his cortex seize as neurons thicken to dark sludge. What seemed <clears throat> a stiff knee is now a jester's dip and lurch. His elbows flap permissionless. Wild rhythms mortify him. His eyes widen with the wrath of them, the swoop and rock. Before, when a student butchered Beethoven, he'd cut in, listen, he'd say, listen to this, and, and launch into something brilliant by Rachmaninoff, change the subject quickly with a Joplin rag. Now his hands muddle even the thunder of his dear Muller. Forgive me, he says to the child who sits lumpish beside him, to Muller to the black notes that still fly across the page of his mind, their music perfect and elusive as birds. Um, so I'll read two more. Um, this is a good spring poem for the Texas Hill Country. It's about wild turkeys and mating season. Um, And um, so this is for Michael Hall, who liked this poem. Initially, there was like an overt um, allusion to the myth Lita and the Swan, but since then that got taken out. And, um, but hopefully there's still a shadow of that, of that myth. So I kept the time. April, and I've come back to this blunt horizon, butting up against a bell jar of blue, and a sun that can bake the meat off anything, even loss where if you hold out your arms at the bluff's edge and breathe deeply enough, the sky will agree to swallow you whole. But it's turkey mating season again. The lovelorn dusty hens congregating over on Horse Hill, scooting willy-nilly in and out of sage and prickly pear, addled by their need. And the water I cool my feet in is the same pale cataract that once spilled past me on, when I sunbaked on the dam, dreaming of the boy I kissed at summer camp, whose mouth drowned out Led Zeppelin's stairway to heaven, his breath on my neck, the way my heart let go its dry tap dance, floundered like a downed bird, the weight of his hands like ballast on my hips, and the hens scatter and drift haphazard as ash, waiting for the kettle drum calls of the gobblers, roosting solitary and oily in the cottonwoods, their bristled beards swinging like scalp belts. After this long coyote winter, all of us still wanting to be stitched into the old cloth of the world's desire, still wading these shallow waters, traipsing these same parched hills, waiting for the sudden shadow blocking out the sun, the beating of wings, 
something, anything to pin us down under all this blue sky. So I'm going to end with something that actually didn't make it into the book, and partly because my brother-in-law Mark is here. Um, this is this is a poem that was um, very loosely based on two things. One was a rooster that we had at our farm that went rogue, but the other was um, uh, my brother-in-law uh, went to war with a. a um, a male pheasant that came in from the woods up above their house and uh, and who just somehow staked a claim to their driveway and so it was, it was a war <coughs> so this is called rooster in rhyme royal and it's written in a in an old french form the chickens conveyed when they bought our farm at the time there seemed no sense in asking why the rooster's name was three alarm. We just assumed it had to do with rising early. We admired his cascading tail, his jaunty comb, his harem of hens. Fine layers, said the seller with a grin. So eager to commence our farming ways, we bought two pigs post haste, patched up the barn and sagging tack house, then replaced the fence, while three patrol the barnyard and eyed us with one beady eye. His surveillance took a dark, darker turn when Jim, my husband, started hammering on the hen house. Next morning after breakfast, we ignored the yellow eye pressed against the window. <laughs> we used the back door, skirted past the porch, and got to work. Three paced and sauntered, so the spurs above his ankles showed. His red comb cocked and marked indifference until he sprang and slashed Jim in the pants. There were no rules of war those next few days. Jim and that rooster circled, struck, and fled, brandished beak and shovel, spurs and rakes. You try ammonia in a squirt gun, said a neighbor. Said a neighbor. Those birds can get right pesky. So at the five and dime in town, Jim procured a plastic water pistol, sleek and purple. We forgot the recommended ammo, so he pumped it full of Bombay gin. <laughs> he slammed back the kitchen door like some pale poncho via. Met three full out in the geranium bed. Before he could take aim, three stru struck, but in a flash, Jim had him by the neck and flapping, wild and crazy eyed. We buried our old rooster over where the well house used to be, put his carcass in a bandolino shoebox. So there we were, roosterless farmers, nothing left to do but reminisce, and then to top it off, a fox got in the chicken coop and picked off all our hens. <laughs>